Hello and welcome to Dielectric Videos. On today's episode, we're going to be discussing a power distribution method known as single wire earth return. Now the basic principle behind single wire earth return is the idea of using the actual earth itself. Let's say these are power lines strung from say a power plant or a source all the way to say a transformer and then a ground rod driven into the ground wherein this transformer can then supply whatever loads are needed. The idea here is using only one single conductor, single phase AC power can be distributed over a long distance to a load and then the circuit can be completed through the earth ground itself. Now because earth is made up of a mixture of minerals and ionic compounds and typically has a large amount of moisture also present, it actually is a, t a fairly typically good conductor. A single ground rod will achieve anywhere from 5 to 25 ohms, which is not that great, uh, but a large area of, say, concrete or a many number of ground rods, concrete, say, with rebar in it, can actually serve as a very effective ground link uh, or conductive link oftentimes achieving up to say 0.5 or down to 0.5 ohms or less of resistance to, to the surrounding earth. If you're wondering, this use of concrete with rebar in it is referred to an oofer ground, U-F-E-R, and it was named after a, uh, a guy that actually worked at a military installation back during World War II in uh, Arizona around Prescott and Flagstaff where they actually were uh, needing a method to ground their buildings for lightning strikes and other systems and found that even in the very dry soil the uh, concrete, large concrete area was quite effective for grounding. So anyway, back to how single wire earth return works, basically by using this system you're creating a phantom, uh, phantom circuit through the earth as the return path for the single phase AC power. Now here's the point at which the experiment that we're going to perform today differs quite substantially from the way single wire earth return is typically implemented. Typically the power distribution voltage on these lines will be anywhere on the order of 10 to 20 kV. And of course that means you only have to transmit a relatively small current and even a modest voltage drop through this ground is not really a big deal because A the voltage is so high and B the current flowing through it is relatively low. For example, at 10 kV, if I wanted to transmit 1 kilowatt, then I would really only have to supply 1,000 over 10,000 or 0.1 amps to get that 1 kilowatt through. And then, even if there is a fairly high resistance through the ground, say 25 ohms, that 0.1 amps would only drop by 2.5 volts, and thus it's quite economical to use this system for the elevated voltages used in uh, medium voltage power distribution systems. What I'm going to be attempting today is a much less commonly implemented method of single wire earth return that might be used in a pinch for delivering power to an outbuilding or some other area uh, remote but not too remote from a main facility with a main power source like a generator or an incoming power feeder using the earth as a secondary return wire. So for example, we might have like a house somewhere with uh, say 120 volts or split phase 12240 coming in from the power pole here. And of course this is going to be referenced to ground in the, uh, in the ground and also at the pole and also at the house uh, main panel will also typically have either an earth ground through a ground rod, an oofer ground through the concrete slab, or a, uh, in older cases, a ground through the water pipe that would then also serve as an earth ground. So let's say you have all that set up, and let's say that I want to distribute power to, say, a work shed really far away, well not really far away, but let's say a couple hundred feet, or maybe just, we'll say, a hundred feet away from the house. If possible, it would be really cool to be able to actually use a single piece of wire, maybe strung to a tree or, or some other fixture or structure, with a really deep ground rod, and then, even without stepping up to the 7.2 kV or so that typically comes in from the pole, 
to be able to use this 120 volt supply to create a single wire earth return phantom circuit through the earth ground to power this building. Now, I've done some preliminary measurements and from what I can tell, it's not going to be particularly effective to do this for larger loads. I am typically able to get really not more than half an amp to an amp through it, which for actually supplying an outbuilding would be completely uh, inadequate. However, it could have its niche applications, for example, powering, say, a uh, just a light bulb that's always on just to keep like as a security light or something or perhaps powering a relatively small continuous load like uh, maybe you have a sensor station collecting weather data out here that needs uh, to always have power but maybe only uses like 10 watts or something like that or even up to the limit of maybe you are trying to have a little camp out somewhere and you want to power your laptop which typically we require an amp or so of power. So the question is, under these conditions, can we make this work? And if so, uh, is it going to be at all viable? Uh, obviously, is, this would really not be code compliant, and as a result, it would not be something you'd want to connect over the long term. But the question I have is, can it be done? Now, going back to the discussion of code compliance here, there is a good reason why this uh, is not typically done beyond just it not being very effective at transmitting power. And that is, it can, under very certain conditions, create hazardous, uh, hazardous conditions in the ground and in the surrounding areas that could lead to an electric shock under the right conditions. One such example would be if there was a poorly grounded uh, swimming pool in between these buildings, the water in this swimming pool might be considerably more conductive than the ground around it, and thus a localized current flow could become uh, present in this water, which would create a serious hazard. Additionally, areas around the ground rods on both the house side and shed side could potentially become higher in potential than the remaining ground area, particularly if there's differences in moisture between the soil here and the soil here, and on the other side here. And this could actually become so severe that perhaps under just the right set of conditions, if a person was standing here and had one foot there and another foot there, uh, they could be in quite some trouble with, uh, with an elevated voltage potential across them. Now at such low voltages, it's probably not hugely likely for this to be an issue. However, it is something to be aware of. And as such, this is not going to be an experiment that I recommend trying at home if you don't know what you're doing or if you're planning on leaving it permanently because as I said, any changes in moisture in the soil could lead a perfectly safe situation on one day to become a very dangerous situation on another day. But in, since this is mainly in the name of science and mainly just to satisfy my own curiosity, I'm going to set up an experimental setup and we're gonna see what happens. All right, so here I have a roughly six foot piece of half inch copper tubing and I'm going to be using this as my experimental ground rod. Now, before I drive this into the ground, I want to note that if you're going to drive anything into the ground or dig a hole of any significant depth for that matter, it's very important to make sure that you know what utilities are located under the ground in that location. Depending on your jurisdiction, there may be hotlines you can call to find out about this, or you can look at your local city planning guides or contact the uh, owner of the property uh, that you're working on to find out what is buried in the area where you're working. The last thing you want to do is drive your uh, ground rod into a gas pipe or a fiber optic line or a power line. And uh, in this case, there are there's a gas line and a water line roughly 20 feet away from where I'm going to be digging. But other than that, the area where I'm going to be driving this rod in is pretty much clear of any utilities. So I'm going to start out uh, with the hammer and I'm going to just pick, and pick a fairly arbitrary spot on the ground here and uh, I'm going to just start driving this rod down and this could take a while it will help that this is a hollow tube it makes it easier to put in So we'll start out here since we're about three or so feet, maybe two and a half feet into the ground. And 
what I have is I've got an extension cord here and I'll show you what kind of setup I'm going to use to test the amount of power we can pull out of here. So as you can see here, I have a 60 watt light bulb plugged into an extension cord and it's burning at pretty much full brightness. Now, a trick you can actually do, and this is a little bit hazardous because it does leave a hot referenced prong of the, out, of, the verse, of the plug exposed, is you can take the hot side of the plug, which is the smaller one, and insert it like this into the hot side of the extension cord. Now the neutral side of the plug is exposed, which we can then use to test uh, the current flow through other objects, such as the ground rod. So let's go do that. All right, so now I'm gonna take my experimental setup and I'm going to touch it to the ground rod. As you can see, the bulb is lit, albeit not at the same brightness that it was when it was directly connected to the ground or to the power cord. Let me show you what full brightness looks like by plugging it back in. You can see it's notably more bright than it was when we were using the ground rod as our return path for current. So with this in mind, this would indicate that it would be relatively safe to perform a short circuit test between the hot on this cable and the ground rod itself. What this will allow us to do, when coupled with the measured open circuit voltage of 120 volts, is to calculate a Thevenin analysis and thus calculate the internal resistance of the ground circuit and thus calculate our maximum power at any arbitrary voltage drop. That is, of course, assuming that we're talking about a fully ohmic load, which is not necessarily true about a ground rod, but is a good approximation. So we can proceed to do that. So I've connected an alligator clip to the ground rod here, and I have my AC current clamp meter set up. I'm going to put this on the 20 amp range, although I don't really expect it to get above maybe 5, possibly 10 amps. And what I'm going to do is grab the other end of the extension cord, I'm going to attach this breakout adapter that allows me to directly connect uh, cords and other part or uh, alligator clips to the cable or to the actual leads. And I'm going to connect this in a short circuit condition. So I have it short circuited. Current is flowing at its maximum rate. Now I'm going to take my clamp meter and I'm going to clamp this line. If you look on the meter, you can see that about 1.3 amps are flowing through this cable. That's not very much, and in fact, we can estimate the ground resistance using this uh, computation. So back inside, we can do a little bit of math with these results. We know that our OCV was 120 volts, that is, open circuit voltage is 120 volts, and we know our, uh, we'll say ISC, which is your short circuit current, was 1.3 4 amps. Now if this is the case, then we can calculate that our resistance, R, would be the uh, voltage, OCV, over the current, ISC, because otherwise V would equal I times R if you manipulated these equations. So thus, 120 volts over 1.34 amps. I don't have a calculator, but I'll say that's approximately on the order of, let's say, 90 ohms. And with that being the case, we have a fairly high resistance through this circuit. Now since the typical minimum voltage for most 120 volt appliances is 100 volts, let's say we can, uh, we can safely assume a maximum voltage drop across the circuit of roughly 20 volts. Well if this is the case and we have a 90 ohm load, then in that case we can draw a maximum of around 20 volts divided by 90 ohms, which would equal about 0.22 amps. This 0.22 amps, or we'll just assume like a quarter of an amp roughly, at 100 volts, means you could get through this ground rod a maximum power of about 25 watts. Now that's actually not too terrible. We could actually presumably use this 25 watts to power a fairly substantial load, say a couple of cell phone chargers, an LED light bulb, or a few LED light bulbs, or you know, any number of relatively small loads. However, it's not gonna be anywhere near enough to power, say, a machine shop or anything fairly substantial that you're gonna put into an outbuilding. In fact, even with the smallest, most efficient laptops, 25 watts would really struggle to power the charger on a laptop computer. 
So with that in mind, let's think of things we could potentially do to improve this figure. So far, we've only driven the ground rod maybe two and a half or three feet into the ground. We could actually, presumably, try to drive this thing all the way down into the ground. Not only will that theoretically double our contact area and potentially cut our resistance nearly in half, assuming the majority of the resistance is around this actual rod, but it may also get a little bit closer to the water table underneath the ground level where the really high conductivity action is going to occur. So we'll go outside, we'll re-drive this even further into the ground, and we'll take a couple more measurements and just do a little guesstimation of uh, whether this is going to be effective or not. All right, so I've driven the ground rod down to about just a, so there's just about a foot left above the top of it. That means there should be roughly five feet of ground rod underground right now. And it should be a fair bit closer to the water table uh, and thus should theoretically not only have double the contact area, but also have higher uh, conductivity the, the, the further down in the ground it is. So let's repeat our short circuit test. We're gonna use the same procedure with the clamp meter. And this time we'll hope to get a bit more power through here. Ah, now we're getting 2.9 amps. So, since that's a little bit over double our previous estimate, now we should be able to get, theoretically, up to 50 watts of power out of this output. That's not half bad. In fact, you could probably run a laptop charger off of that. All right, so I've connected a laptop computer charger in the same configuration discussed above to power my XPS 13. So let's see what happens when I set the computer down here, and I get our ground rod alligator clip together and I connect it. It appears as if the computer is charging. Let me show you that up close. As you can see here, see if it says, yep, it's connected and it is charging indeed. I'm also running Prime 95 to maximize the load in order to see if there's any uh, dropout issues where the charger is like browning out and turning off and there do not seem to be any problems with that, which is very impressive. So we are in fact powering a laptop computer at full Prime 95 test load through the earth itself, using the ground, the earth ground itself, as a return path for AC current. That's pretty cool, isn't it? All right, for one last test, I'm going to attempt to run this ion portable speaker, which uses this external wall adapter supplying 12 volts at up to 3.5 amps using the single wire earth return method. So let's find out how it works. Looks like it works fairly effectively. Anyway, this is a demonstration of a relatively low performance single wire earth return system at 120 volts AC. It works, it's probably not the best way to do it and it does create its own set of hazards, but it does actually work and I am really excited to find out that uh, my hypothesis about single wire earth return at lower voltages is in fact correct, that it can be used for limited load supplies. So hopefully you learned something today about power distribution. Thanks for watching Dielectric videos, and I will see you next time.